I still remember the first time that I set foot inside the Kihiki Supper Club. Now, the restaurant was located at East Broad Street in Napoleon across from the Desert Inn. I must have been around 10 years old. Now, December nights in Columbus, Ohio were always cold, and I can still feel the biting wind that cut through the huge parking lot and made my eyes sting during the short walk from our station wagon to the restaurant. Two 20-foot tiki idols stood guard at the front door, beckoning me inside a building that looked as if a boat had been sucked right out of the South Pacific and plopped down in the middle of the Midwest. And that was just the outside. Inside was a world apart from the frozen Ohio night. Torches lined the walls, and the whole place was fragrant, warm, a little humid. Probably a nod to some fictional place of tropical inspiration. But it was pure magic. From America's Test Kitchen, I'm Bridget Lancaster, and this is Proof. The Kihiki Supper Club completely captured my imagination as a child. And although I was way too young to partake at the time, I did see my parents get to experience the added escape of a Mai Tai. And it was delivered to the table by a Polynesian goddess, of course. As an adult, I totally get the appeal. Because a tiki drink has the power to mentally transport me somewhere else different in every way from my reality. It's a place that's warm, beachy, where my biggest worry is falling coconuts. But I learned something recently that really got me wondering, and it's that the Mai Tai was actually created in Oakland. Not Hawaii, not Polynesia, not some tropical paradise. Oakland, California. Now, what else have I taken for granted about tiki drinks? It turns out, a lot. Act One, The Origins of Tiki. The real controversy at the heart of the Mai Tai's origin story has nothing to do with geography. It's actually between two men, and you've probably heard of one of them, Trader Vic. Trader Vic wasn't just the name of a restaurant chain. He was a real person. His name was Victor Jules Bergeron, Now, he was born in San Francisco in 1902 to a French-Canadian waiter and grocery store operator. Besides running his now-famous restaurants, he was also a writer and a self-taught artist. His 1984 obituary in the New York Times stated that his paintings, handcrafted jewelry, and sculpture have, quote, received both popular acclaim and modest critical praise, end quote. Bergeron had a wooden leg, And allegedly, he loved to tell stories about losing it to a shark in the South Seas. But in reality, the leg was amputated when he was six years old to prevent tuberculosis from spreading to his knee. The point is, he was a serious character. His granddaughter, Eve Bergeron, is still actively involved in the company. His first restaurant actually was not called Trader Vic's. It was Hinky Dinks. My name is Eve Bergeron, and we're at Trader Vic's in Emeryville, California. The original location actually started on San Pablo Avenue in 1934, and it actually started as a little uh, beer parlor, and in 37, it adopted a Polynesian decor um, and started serving Chinese food and um, tropical drinks. Trader Vic, Victor Jules Bergeron, he was my grandfather. Um, there's a song, and it's very limericky, and it's from World War I, and it's kind of naughty. <laughs> so it was Hinky Dinks Parlez-Vous, and um, so that was the name of the first restaurant in Oakland. From the stalls, the ladies were tickled by his manly balls. Hinky Dinks Parlez-Vous. Bergeron opened Hinky Dinks with just over $1,000. 300 of his own money, and 800 that he borrowed from an aunt. Now, that wasn't very much, even back then. And it was that same resourcefulness that earned him his nickname. Eve explained this. 
you know, people were really poor at that time and he would barter with them. A lot of people came in, they didn't have any money. And so they would bring him something uh, that he could sell in the restaurant. And so he was like always trading something. Oh yeah, okay. Um, so it was his nickname, Trader Vic. That stuck and then that eventually evolved. And when he reopened, it became Trader Vic's. Trader Vic was pretty much the only name that I ever knew in the whole tiki bar phenomenon. I always thought he was the one who started it, but it turns out I was wrong. The man considered the true founding father of the tiki movement was a guy by the name of Ernest Gant, who later changed his name to Don Beach. He opened a bar at the very end of 1933 in Hollywood that was his own vision of an imaginary island paradise. He took the basic formula of the Caribbean planter's punch and started making more elaborate, complex, exotic cocktails. Meanwhile, Trader Vic was embarking on a tiki pilgrimage. He traversed the United States, stopping in New Orleans. Eve Bergeron again. Then went on to Cuba, and he studied with Constantino of the La Florida Bar, and that's where he learned to make a, a perfect daiquiri. Him and Don Beachcomber had a riff. Now, remember, Don was building a tiki empire of his own. According to some, he viewed Trader Vic, this new kid on the block, as a friendly rival. Well, there was a lot of um, fracas about who invented the Mai Tai. <laughs> it's funny because most people think it was invented in Hawaii, and it was actually just in Oakland. He had two friends visiting from Tahiti, and so he concocted this drink and just a squeeze of lime, some really great rum, a um, little orange curacao. Uh, I think at that time it was falernum, and which is an almond flavoring syrup. Made it for his friends, and she, you know, they were coming from Tahiti, and so she said, Mai Tai Roe, and it means the best out of this world. And the name stuck. And actually later on, um, when it was disputed of who made the drink, uh, she proved it, and there's pictures of the two of them together. And by she, Eve means so the friend who was visiting from Tahiti. You know, and she's all, I was there <laughs> in that historic moment, if you can believe it. So that settles it. Trader Vic invented the Mai Tai in Oakland, at least according to his granddaughter Eve. But that's really just the beginning of the story of Tiki. Trader Vic and Don the Beachcomber started the first Tiki bars in the 1930s and 40s, but they were only in a few isolated places. So how did Tiki spread across the country and become a full-blown phenomenon? Act Two, The Rise of Tiki Culture. A classic exotic tiki bar is designed to create a transportive experience, taking you away from the mundanity of your job and the outside world to create this imaginary world. This is Martin Kate. He's the owner of Smuggler's Cove Bar in San Francisco. A sort of imagined Polynesian island. It's not really quite real. It's sort of neither here nor there, but it's somewhere distant, dreamlike and always in sort of perpetual dusk. It's the idea is that it's always the cocktail hour, it's always time for a drink, and you've walked in and there's no windows and you've forgotten about the outside world and you've let the stress fall off your shoulders and we're here to provide you with a really interesting layered complex rum cocktail. Martin is considered the leading rum and exotic cocktail expert here in the States, but that wasn't always the case. He was actually working in Washington, D.C. at an embassy deeply involved in European trade policy. It was this life-changing visit to uh, the Washington, D.C. Hilton. It was you know, very marble, very gray. And there, inside the hotel, was the Trader Fix. But coming into the basement and finding this sort of magic portal, this doorway to Trader Vicks, you know, flanked on either side by these tiki gods and flickering torches, and you walk through, and there's this transformative experience where you leave the hotel and you leave everything else, and it's just to walk into this space where, you know, the... Uh, the lights are dim, the smells like gardenias. And it really uh, struck a chord with me, this notion that there was this whole other world. I didn't know you could enjoy dining and drinking in such an experiential way. And so that was really a, a magical uh, uh, experience for me. Now, I just want to pause here and point this out. Martin's visit to that Trader Vic's literally changed the trajectory of his life. He's not working as a bureaucrat in a drab office building in D.C. anymore. These days, he's running one of the best tiki bars in the country. He's also basically a walking tiki historian. 
Tiki uh, means first man, and it references any number of different Polynesian icons. And every uh, every Polynesian culture had their own take on it, and their own uh, variations on the story, or their own styles of art. So this icon, this figure, became incredibly popular in America in the 1950s. It became this sort of totemic god of leisure. It was sort of a representative icon of unwinding and relaxing, and it sort of spoke to a lot of things. It spoke to a desire to escape the confines of the nine to five and the workaday world. It spoke to a sort of a sense of danger and mystery. Americans had long been fascinated since the late 19th century with the South Pacific and tales of adventure. So this figure, when he showed up around outside of buildings and people's backyards and things, he he existed as a icon of this this need to escape and this need to get out from underneath the strictures of a Eisenhower era Protestant work ethic. So while Tiki may have started as a novelty in the 1930s and 40s, it caught on in a big way after the Second World War. And there's a reason for that. Back to Martin Kate. The big influence we like to talk about is how, even though Don and Vic were established in the 1930s and were successful in starting to grow, it was really right after World War II that this thing began to really take off. Ashore, the traditional welcome. The Hawaiian lays that greet every visitor. So the GIs coming back who'd served in the Pacific Theater, you know, in between the firefights and the blood on the beach, they definitely spent plenty of downtime in R&R facilities or waiting to be transferred somewhere. So they'd be in Hawaii. And here's the lad who receives the most flowery welcome of all. Oh, for the life of a sailor. So they had fond memories of the warm breezes and the palm trees and the sailor bars. And... and when they came back and reacclimated into society, they, you know, tended to look back on the, you know, the more positive aspects of their experience, which had been these times spent with a rum cocktail on a beach somewhere. That was all fueled very much by the publication of a book called Tales of the South Pacific by James Missioner in 1947. That book won the Pulitzer Prize that year and went on to be turned into the musical South Pacific. It added a big wave of nostalgia for that experience for people. So it helped fuel these bars that already had existed and uh, then started to grow because they were already trading on that South Pacific atmosphere. After the break, we return to that scene from my childhood, a tiki bar in Columbus, Ohio, in the dead of winter. Before we get back to our story, time for a quick test kitchen intermission with Jack Bishop. We are going to be tasting the secret ingredient in a Mai Tai, as well as a lot of tiki cocktails that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, It is a French almond syrup. Um, It looks like you would say it Orgiat. Uh, the pronunciation that is correct is think of Zsa Zsa Gabor okay. as you're saying this. Uh, orjat. Oh, okay. I thought you meant you wanted me to slap you. <laughs> no? <laughs> I'd prefer that that did not occur. <laughs> okay. So, Orjat. Orjat. Uh, the history of this is really interesting. It actually uh, dates back to the 18th century in France. Uh, the word means barley water. At some point or other, somebody replaced the barley with something more flavorful, which would be almonds. So it's almonds in sugar syrup with either rose blossom or orange blossom water. It has a floral aroma and flavor that kind of works um, with the Mai Tai, uh, the other tiki cocktails. It also has the bitterness from the almonds, which offsets all of that sweetness. Those bottles that they have to get, uh, you know, a flavored cappuccino or latte, Mm -hmm. they're often using orzat. And so it's probably a place that you may have seen it rather than hidden somewhere in the back of the tiki bar. Uh, Right, which is so dark you can't see back there anyway. You can't see anything. Mm -hmm. Um, So you want to you want to taste? Sure. We made this in the test kitchen. Ah, that's not bad at all. Um, 
very deeply flavored, nicely balanced. It tastes toasted. Well, it is toasted. Ah. It is made with whole almonds, so the darker color is because the skins are on. Uh, We toasted those almonds before we pulverized them in a food processor, and then we soaked them in the sugar syrup. The longer you soak it, you might get a little bit more flavor, strain through cheesecloth, and then you add orange blossom and then some vodka, which will help preserve it. You could sip this on its own. It's beautiful. It actually has body to it as well. If you swirl it around in the glass, it's clinging to the sides. I love the toasted flavor. With a vodka in it, it won't last very long in my house. (laughs) So we're going to post this recipe on our website uh, and be sure to check that out. But Jack, thanks for taking me down uh, the road of Orsha. You're welcome, Bridget. Act three, the fall of Tiki. Now, I remember tiki seemed to be absolutely everywhere in the 60s and 70s, and I loved it. I mean, one of my favorite Brady Bunch memories, and it actually spanned three whole episodes, was about their travels to Hawaii. They find this cursed tiki icon. Well, I told you before, this whole island is full of those foolish old stories and superstitions. You mean like the idol we found? Yeah. Hey, you guys don't really believe that jazz, do you? Now look, Dave. A lot of goofy things have been happening since we got this thing. We'd like to find out a little more about it. I loved it. I loved everything, Tiki. Now, some of my best childhood memories are those trips that my family took to the Kahiki Supper Club in Columbus. That place is imprinted on my memory forever. But how did Tiki make it to Columbus in the first place? How did the phenomenon move from the West Coast to Middle America? Martin actually uses the Kahiki as an example of peak tiki when tiki bars were at their pinnacle across America. It's almost all the more satisfying when you've got a tiki bar in a place like Columbus because you can imagine even more, you know, how charming a January in Columbus is. It tends to be a little frosty and a little cold and, you know, long nights. And so to be able to have this place where you could open the door and it's warm and it's dimly lit and then there's tropical drinks and fruit juices and things, it's it's uh, all the more special by your distance from Polynesia. I still get back to Columbus quite often. I have family there. But the Kihiki is gone. And its place is a Walgreens. It's kind of the perfect example of the demise of Tiki. Martin explains this really well. It doesn't really end until... um well into the 70s, really. I mean, things kind of started to slow down. And and then eventually, as America went through the 60s and became a less naive country, and we knew more about the world around us, particularly as we were at war in Southeast Asia, there were a lot of factors here, but it certainly began to not quite seem to be a charming escape anymore. It sort of lost a lot of its magic and its a charm. Tastemakers had sort of turned on it as calling it kitschy, you know, for the first time. And and, uh, we also, of course, had a generational shift. I mean, the people who enjoyed tiki bars were World War II generation, but their kids, the boomers, you know, nobody wants to do what your dad does. And so they started to pull away from it. They found it to be tacky or, you know, they also found other interests like drugs, which were of more interest than tropical drinks. So it all just started to die fairly slowly. And But when it did die, it died a very hard death because everything was torn to the ground or completely remodeled. And so anything that uh, celebrated a Polynesian pop aesthetic that we love so much tended to be completely destroyed. So there's so little evidence left of it when it was, in fact, hugely prevalent around the United States between not just the bars, but also apartment complexes and uh, shopping malls and all kinds of architecture around America. A few of the original tiki holdouts from the 1950s survived the fall of tiki. They're still around. You've got the Maikai in Fort Lauderdale, and I've thrown back a few fog cutters at the Kowloon up on Route 1 North in Saugus, Massachusetts. But now tiki bars are popping up all over the place, and Martin is leading the tiki revival. Act 4. Tiki Revival. We can walk down to your bar and you can kind of describe some of the 
the bottles and whatnot? Sure. Martin gave our producer Brandy Hal a tour of Smuggler's Cove. It's covered floor to ceiling in tiki ephemera. So down here on the main floor, this is sort of the most dramatic space because we have the highest ceilings. In here, you'll find nautical bric-a-brac, our flotsam and jetsam. A lot of the tiki stuff that's in here comes from old tiki bars that have closed down. So uh, vintage ephemera going back to the 1940s and 50s. Uh, we've got some World War One, World War II memorabilia in here. And uh, it's a question of hunting for years, you know, between thrift stores, antique malls, warehouse sales, people's personal collections, finding bars when they're going out of business, things like that. This is a decade-long collection that we put into place here. And this isn't just a bunch of cool stuff. Martin has intentionally collected items that tell the backstory he's created about Smuggler's Cove. So when you step inside, you're essentially stepping inside his imagination. Kind of came up with a backstory about an imagined cave somewhere on the back of an island where smugglers would hide and have their secret clubhouse. And so the idea was to create this magical space by filling it with as much interesting ephemera as we could. But let's face it, no one goes to a bar for the decor alone, no matter how cool it is. Smuggler's Cove focuses on really, really good drinks. I was the first person to bring together this burgeoning craft cocktail movement with tiki at my first bar. Today, what we find is that a lot of the craft bars enjoy making exotic cocktails because when they look at these historic recipes and they see that it's fresh juices and house-made syrups and spices, and they're looking back in time 60, 70 years at these recipes, but they're also seeing kindred spirits. The integrity of these ingredients matches the integrity of what's happening in, in craft cocktails. And thank goodness Martin is doing this. I mean, try to find an authentic Mai Tai out there. It's nearly impossible You end up with a red cocktail, a bunch of fruit salad on top, and it's all laced with really cheap rum. And that's not what I want. So I like to think of Martin and his crew as kind of tiki evangelists. They're bringing back some purity, but they're also making it a little bit sexy. Now, one of the things we have to do that craft guys don't have to do, let's say, for example, a Manhattan. Before the craft cocktail revival, you went into a regular bar or hotel bar or something, and you ask for a Manhattan. Well, you might, you know, you get some bourbon. They probably forget the bitters. The vermouth's probably really old. They probably shake it, you know, but it's something served to you that would be recognizable as a Manhattan. I think we've all been subjected to this sad excuse for a Manhattan. Now, what happened with exotic cocktails, on the other hand, is during this great purge and when all these places were being torn down, all these recipes were lost. Martin just referred to the great purge, Now, he's talking about the fact that many of the great cocktail recipes were lost during the fall of tiki. And that's because some of the original recipes were written in code, and some were secret, passed down through word of mouth from one tiki bartender to another. So when buildings were torn down and bartenders passed away, many of those great recipes were lost as well. So what happened is you've got legendary cocktails, wonderful drinks like the Mai Tai being completely debased, reduced to none of their original components. You would go to a bar and say, I'm a Mai Tai. Well, I guess that means some orange juice, some pineapple juice, some sour mix, a couple kinds of rum, maybe a little grenadine. And you'd get this thing. There's nothing in common with a Mai Tai, nothing at all. It has no even shared ingredients. But Martin and his tiki brethren aren't just restoring the integrity of these old-school tiki cocktails. They're also taking traditional recipes and pushing the boundaries. They're trying to improve or innovate on the originals. When Don Beach was crafting these exotic cocktails, he based them all on the straight-ahead formula of the planner's punch, which is easy to remember because it comes in a rhyme. One of sour, two of sweet, three of strong, four of weak. And this formula, one of sour, some lime juice, two of sweet, some sugar, three of strong, the rum, four of weak, other juices, uh, things that might be available, or just ice or water. So that formula is really handy to work with, and it gives you the jumping off point. So basically, exotic cocktails are taking that formula and just making them as Baroque as possible. So why be lime when you can do lime and lemon and orange or grapefruit? Why do just sugar when you can do honey or maple syrup or demerara sugar? Why do one rum when you can do four rums? And as far as the week's concerned, you know, that can be any number of different juices or, as I like to say, just ice cubes are fine. So is this group of tiki evangelists going to succeed in restoring tiki to its former glory? It seems like even Martin doesn't think so. 
the community today is smaller. I mean, it's never going to reach the heights it once did in the 19. 19- 50s and 60s, you know, it's never going to have that kind of intensity. But I think in every major market, there's room for a tiki bar. I think they're iconically American, and I think they're just as valid as a sports bar. It's something that we invented as a people. They're a wonderful example of American imagination and creativity from an era when Americans loved themed dining and themed experience, and they loved artifice, whether it was, you know, uh, Snow Lodge themed place or a Bavarian schnitzel house or a Mexican hacienda themed place, whatever it was, it's that people really enjoyed that artifice and that structure of a space that told you a story. And uh, I think there's going to be room for that for a long time to come. There are still some themed dining places out there, but I can't think of anything that's so immersive that it takes you away from where you are and puts you into this place that unless you live in Hawaii, is completely different from what you can see outside of your window. You can't always afford to go to Maui or Tahiti, but you can go down the street for a drink. And if that brings a little bit of happiness to your life, then I think that's great. So where should we end this tiki journey? How about back where we started? Eve Bergeron was kind enough to give us her grandfather's original Mai Tai recipe. You have Jamaican rum, and that, at that time, it was a 17-year-old rum, J. Ray Nephew from Jamaican. And so uh, orange curacao, not blue curacao, orange curacao, which is a bitter orange, orgeat, which is almond, and fresh squeezed lime. The thing that is with the lime, it is so important because we dropped the spent uh, lime shell in the top of the drink because it, you still have the oils from the lime shell. And then um, mint, when you slap the mint, it kind of adds to the whole kit and caboodle. Thanks so much to San Francisco-based reporter Brandy Howell for producing the story. Chances are, there's a new tiki bar near you. So if you're looking for a place to escape and unwind, go give it a visit. But if not, pick up a copy of Martin Kate's excellent book, Smuggler's Cove, Exotic Cocktails, Rum, and the Cult of Tiki. It's got recipes for the classic Mai Tai and other drinks, plus tips on setting up your own home tiki bar. Proof is hosted and produced by me, Bridget Lancaster. Our executive producer is Caitlin Kelleher. Sarah Joyner is our producer. Scoring sound design and mixing by Matt Boynton. Editing by Caitlin Kelleher, Sarah Joyner, and Jordan Pearson. Brian Campbell of Signal Sounds composed our theme music. Additional music by Kyle Forrester. Post-production support from Hen Margolis. Our production manager is Diane Knox. Jack Bishop is the chief creative officer and big kahuna of America's Test Kitchen. David Nussbaum is our CEO. Thanks again to our sponsors, Bob's Red Mill, Kohler, Chef Steps, and Escoffier. Proof is a production of America's Test Kitchen. And if you want to check out old photographs or some of the tiki establishments we talked about on the show, or you want to grab that original Mai Tai recipe from Eve Bergeron, check out our website www.americastestkitchen.com slash proof. Oh, and one more thing. If you like proof, please leave us a rating or write us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other people find the show. 